welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Matthew chapter 11, in the truth version, of course. Verse 28. Everyone who feels tired and oppressed... These days I qualify for the tired bit more than the oppressed. Everyone who feels tired and oppressed, come to me and I will give you rest. Be united with me and learn from me, for I have a humble and gentle heart. Then you will find peace for your souls. When you are united with me, I make light of your burden. Then if you go on to chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, Well, actually, we'll start from verse 15. Aware of their plans, Jesus withdrew from there, but many followed him, and he healed all the sick among them, warning them not to say who he was. This fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. This is my chosen servant, the one I love, And in whom I delight. My servant will be upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight, nor will he make his voice heard in the streets. He will not snap a bruised reed, nor will he extinguish a smoldering wick, until he has first led those who love justice to victory. In his name, the nations will place their hope. Two extraordinary scriptures, really, when you put them together, that Jesus describes himself as having a humble and gentle heart, and yet he is the one, the Lord of power, who heals all the sick. He is the one who brings justice to the nations, who is the hope of nations, who is the almighty, all-powerful one. Now, if I was to ask you, what is God's purpose for your life? I might get some interesting answers. Probably get a variety of answers. But there's only one correct answer. God's purpose for your life is that you become more and more like Jesus. The more like Jesus you are, the more effective you will be in whatever ministry God leads you into, the more effective as a witness, the more effective as a disciple, the more impact you will have upon the lives of other people. This is the only right answer because the scripture says to us that God is transforming or transfiguring us into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. And that when we see him as he is, when we see him face to face, we shall be like him. That will be the fulfillment of the purpose. So the question before us this morning is, what does it mean to be like Jesus for us, now, today. Uh, The scripture also says that any who claim to live in him, to live in Christ, must walk as Jesus did. So, of course, our ability to walk as Jesus did is dependent upon how like him we are. Now, we know that he is in us. He's not just with us, but Christ in us, the hope of glory. So let's begin with his heart. He has a humble and gentle heart. Elsewhere, we see that he is tender-hearted. 
that he has a heart of compassion. Uh, even in the second scripture that we read, he will not snap a bruised reed, nor will he extinguish a smoldering wick. Great tenderness, great love, gentleness, compassion. You like that? That's what he's like. Are you like that? David prayed to have a heart after the heart of God. So that's what his heart's like. It's not that he's soft-hearted. He's certainly not hard-hearted. But he's strong-hearted. There's a strength in being tender. There's a strength in being loving. There's a strength in being compassionate, merciful, kind. And you know that when those qualities are being exhibited in the life of a believer, that something of the heart of Jesus is being demonstrated in practice. Alongside that, we... uh, We see what it means to Jesus for people to be his disciples. Now, remember that in Scripture, a disciple is not someone who follows the Master, but is someone who wants to be like the Master. A disciple of of any rabbi treated that teacher as his mentor and he wanted to be like him. That's why he spent as much time with him as possible. And alongside this sort of tenderness, compassion and love, Jesus talks about a disciple hating himself hating the idea of mother, father, brother, sister, anyone else, being in a more significant position than Jesus is. Jesus talks about losing a soul, and of course he, you see, it's being like Jesus because he counted himself nothing. He denied himself, he emptied himself of his glory and went to the cross. So he says, well, if you want to be like me, you know, that's how you've got to be. Uh, He came not to live for himself, not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. So Jesus was fully, totally committed to the will of his Father. He lived for the will of his Father. So if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to be like that. We're just living for his will. We're not living for any will of our own, any purpose of our own. We know he has a plan. He has a purpose. And... If it means we've got to deny ourselves, deny what we want, or deny any vision or plan or purpose that we would have for ourselves, then we're willing to do that because we want to be like Jesus, who came not to do his own will, but the will of the one who sent him. So as those who are like Jesus, 
We want to do the will of God no matter what that is or what it costs us. And you see this total devotion in Jesus to his Father. (coughs) How closely he lived with the Father so that he could be completely identified with the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. And yet in his humanity, he was just like us, weak and tempted as we are. But he never sinned because he never wanted to. We only sin when we want to. When we choose self above the plans and purposes of God. So, um, for Jesus, a disciple really is one who's just sold out for God just sold out for the Lord. And of course the great commission is to go and make disciples, not churchgoers, not uh, casual believers, but disciples. Uh, Jesus was radical. You could never say that Jesus went for the safe options. Hello? I mean, if we're going to be like Jesus, then we're going to be radical. We're going to be radical in our faith, radical in our actions. Amen? We're not going to hold back out of self-concern or fear or anything like that. We're prepared to step out in obedience to God no matter what that is going to involve. When it came to things that were in opposition to the will of his Father, Jesus was confrontational. Uh, A lot of Christians don't want to be radical, and they certainly don't want to be confrontational. But Jesus was both radical and confrontational. Now, we can't say that he was wrong in being like that because he is the Lord. It's not so much being confrontational with people, but being confrontational with the things that mess people's lives up. Being confrontational with the powers of darkness that impinge upon people's lives and affect them and afflict them. So Jesus could be confrontational because he was the man of authority. Lordship is his ultimate authority. But of course he only had that authority because he humbled himself under the authority of his father. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see your ability to resist the devil comes out of your submission to God. When you submit to his authority, you can exercise his authority over anything that comes against you. Any believers in the room this morning? So we see this man in his humanity, this man of great compassion, great love, great humility coming not to be served, but to serve. Which raises an interesting question. Are you here to be served or to serve? Hello. 
Uh, you could say, are you here to be loved or to love? Of course, the more you love, the more you are loved. Huh? The more you serve, the easier it is for you to receive. The more you receive. So, Jesus was his great servant who constantly gave. Very interesting that in the first chapter of John, as you all know from your John studies, when John is recording his one great title after another as to who Jesus is, slips in this little word of testimony of what it meant to actually live with Jesus. And he says, from his fullness, we all received grace upon grace. So what it was like to live with Jesus is that he was always giving always giving of himself, always giving. It was just grace upon grace. We deserve nothing because grace is what God gives to those that deserve nothing. So he's saying, you know, we knew that before him we deserve nothing, but all he did was give and give and give and give of himself. Every day was a day of his grace. He just poured himself out. You like that? Is this how you live? Is this your heart? And of course, because he lived to give, he wasn't living for himself, but in order to fulfill the will of his Father. So the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of giving was on the cross. Now, if we just pause for a moment in seeing what Jesus is like. And think of the Father. Because, of course, Jesus reflected the nature and character of the Father. The character of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all the same. Character of the Spirit is just like the character of Jesus. Character of Jesus is just like the character of the Father. So this means that God the Father, his desire is to constantly give of himself. Some... uh, Sometime in the 1930s, there was a famous Anglican bishop who was a true man of God. That can happen. (laughs) And uh, uh, (coughs) he had a very big impact upon a lot of people. It's said that probably more people came into Christian ministry uh, through him than anybody else at that time. He was a real motivator for people to give their lives uh, into full-time ministry. And one of the things that he said is, God eternally lives to give himself. You see, God expressed himself in creation. God expresses himself in Jesus. God expresses himself in the way that he constantly wants to give. 
Now, if Christians really believed and understood that that is the nature of God, they wouldn't have many problems in receiving from him. Because, you see, the, the, the problem that many have when they have a need in their lives is wondering whether God wants to give to them the answer, the healing, the miracle, or whatever it is that's needed. Whereas if they understood the nature of God, it, he, he lives to give himself. And so when he became man in Jesus, Jesus was that man of grace who constantly lived to give himself. Now, here's here's the issue, isn't it? Are we giving of ourselves or are we giving of Jesus? (laughs) You see... For Jesus, the spirit and soul were so, his soul was so submitted to his spirit, so at one with the spirit, that you could say, well, well, if Jesus gave of himself, he he gave of Jesus. (laughs) If you understand what I mean. But we've got a self-life that is apart from Jesus. Hello? And the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword that cuts to the division of soul and spirit. So if God is transforming us into his likeness of ever-increasing glory, what is he wanting to do? What he's wanting that soul life to become more and more like the life of the Spirit, more and more submitted to the Spirit, so that our sort of natural response, reaction to situations is for Jesus to flow out of us. For us to be giving Jesus away. That, In other words... If I give of myself, I give of Jesus. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He, he wants us to be in that place where, where however we act, however we react, however we speak, whatever our attitudes are, they're, they're Jesus. Now, if we're honest... And no person at Rothfi would be dishonest. Then we would recognize that that is sometimes the case, but not always the case. Which is why God is still transforming us, changing us, transfiguring us into his likeness. So it becomes more and more the case. Now, of course, whatever Jesus said and whatever he did, he was expressing his nature. So, we are to express our new nature. Christ in us. See, th- this is the problem, isn't it? There's us, or let's put it personally, there's me, and there's Christ in me. Uh-huh. And sometimes there's me, and sometimes there's Christ in me. But the more me becomes like Christ, the more of Jesus will come forth and the less of me. Huh? The wonderful thing is that in me and in you is the fullness of Christ. Uh, It isn't that he says, right, well now, the more you act like me, the more of myself I'll give to you. No, 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 no. He says, I've given you the whole lot. I've given you everything I am, all that I have, all that I have, uh, all that I am, all that I have is yours. You are already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. 
You have already come to the fullness of life in Christ. You've already got the whole deal. It's not part of Christ in you. It's not a blessing from Christ in you. It's not just an anointing from Christ in you. It's Christ in you. And that's actually even better than having the human Jesus because the human Jesus had not gone through the cross and the resurrection into the glory. But you've got the glorified, risen, exalted Christ in you. You've got the victorious, overcoming Christ in you. So Jesus says these quite challenging things like, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. Why? Because if he has faith in me, he's going to be like me. If you've got faith in me, he's going to say what I would say, do what I would do, pray as I would pray, believe what I would believe. Amen? Amen. You see, there's uh, <clears throat> some very simple ways in which we can help ourselves in this whole business. I mean, you know, we don't need to make it complicated and make it think, ooh, you're going to be all so spiritual like Jesus. No, no, no. It's got to be very practical, very down to earth. So you just get used to asking yourself a series of questions. Like, when you come to pray about a situation, you ask yourself before you pray, now, what would Jesus believe? Well, if that's what Jesus believed, that's what I'm to believe. So now we know what to believe. Because you actually do know pretty well what Jesus would believe, no matter what situation you're in. So how would Jesus pray? Okay, well, that's how I'm going to pray, because I've got Christ in me. And I've got the power and authority to pray in his name, so I'll pray what Jesus would pray. Because I'm called to do what he would do. Now, if Jesus was in my situation, what would he say? Okay, well, that's what I'll say, because actually Jesus is in my situation. He's in me. Hello? So I don't want to say something different from what Jesus says in my situation. So I'm going to speak good over my life. I'm going to speak good over the lives of the others around me, because that's what Jesus would do. He didn't come to judge, so... I'm not going to judge. He came to save. So I want to speak salvation. I'm going to speak healing. I'm going to speak health. Because salvation is healing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. Same word in the Greek. <clears throat> the healing of our bodies is just part of the saving work of Jesus. Yeah. That's why he healed bodies. Because he came as the Savior. Not as the healer. He's not called the healer. He's called the savior. But the savior healed. Hello? I'm happy. Anybody else happy? So you see, it's, it's so practical. It's so down to earth. We don't have to be all super spiritual about it. Because, you see, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You know what Jesus would believe. You know what Jesus would say. You know what Jesus would do. And the temptation is to say, yeah, 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 but I'm not, I'm not Jesus. But wait a minute, he's in you. So if you give way to him and speak what he would speak and do what he would do, we're home and dry. Amen. Amen. It's simply daring to believe it. Yes. Yes. It's daring to believe it. Daring to believe that if God tells you to do something, it's going to work. God tells you to do X and Y, and you do X and Y, and a miracle happens. Well, well of course, of course. All you did was just act as the messenger or the instrument. He did the, he did the business. 
Hello. So this is being like Jesus. Good fun, really. Now, it's also obvious that there are certain things that are not like Jesus. And, And if we allow the things that are not like Jesus, then they're going to sort of counteract the things that are like Jesus. So we've got to cut out the things that are not like Jesus, right? Now, Jesus was afraid. Was he? No, of course not. So we're not. I mean, he says, fear not. See? There's no fear in Jesus. Jesus is love, and perfect love of God casts out all fear. Jesus was never afraid. He was in one situation after another where, humanly speaking, the reaction would be fear. Mm hmm. I love it, you know, when they were going to throw him off a cliff and he just walks through the lot of them. (laughs) Bye-bye. And not one of them can touch him. That's it, come on. Very good. Why wasn't... Well, no, we won't go into all the details of that, but it's an interesting one, that. But you see... He was so secure in resting in his father's love. He knew that nothing could happen to him that would be against the will of his father. Things could come at him, but they wouldn't affect him. Hello? I mean, constant opposition, rejection, and, 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 and unbelief, and lies, and everything were constantly coming at him. And he just seems completely impervious to everything. Yeah. Why? Because he was so secure in himself. Amen? Just so secure. One of my former secretaries became a missionary in Africa. And she uh, liked to go swimming. It got hot sometimes. But there were crocodiles in the river where she swam. Never fazed her. Because she believed the crocodiles couldn't touch her because she was under the Lord's protection. Another member of the team went out to spend some time with her and she said, let's go swimming. And, you know, the other girls said, what about the crocodiles? So oh, that's all right, we'll be okay. God will care for us. So they got in the water and, uh, uh, and this girl turned to the visitor and she said, you're afraid, aren't you? And she said, yes. So she said, well, please get out the water because your fear will attract the crocodiles. Is there a sermon there? Fear attracts the crocodiles? So she got out of the water, but the missionary, she, she just continued to swim. Now, not everybody has that kind of faith, let's face it. And she, she did some very, very brave things. She went into dangerous areas as a young, white, single woman all on her own. Uh, but she said, it's okay, the Lord is with me. She got mugged a couple of times, said, that's all right. They can't hurt me. They can't harm me. I'm here in obedience to the Lord. She uh, translated the whole of the Kingdom Faith teaching course into 
the local languages and would go around remote villages that had never heard the gospel and take the recordings in their own language, leave them with a, in those days they were cassette tapes, leave them with a cassette recorder, and the whole villages would hear the gospel and turn to Christ. I mean, you know, it's no limit to what God can do. But you see, the, the fear of the crocodile, or the lack of fear of the crocodiles, that was just a symptom of a much deeper faith that was a great to enable a whole village to hear the gospel as they've never heard it before. I mean, praise God. So we, we, we're, we're not going to be a people of fear. That's why Jesus said, you know, fear not. <laughs> yes? Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I, you know, I used to be a very fearful person. My natural reaction in some instances is to fear, but immediately you let your faith kick in. See, and God taught me years ago. He said, Colin, how can you be afraid if I'm with you? What is there to be afraid of if I am with you? So if your immediate reaction is to fear because of the situation you're in or because you're asked to do a particular thing, all you have to do is, well, I don't need to feel this fear. I just come against that because Jesus is with me. And in Jesus there is no fear. And the one who is within me is not afraid. And the one who is within me will take me through this will enable me to do whatever I have to do, say whatever I need to say. But fear attracts the crocodiles. The enemy can use fear. And actually, if we listen to our fears, that will paralyze us into inactivity. See, that's why the enemy wants people to be afraid because when they're afraid, they seize up. Huh? And God wants to take us. He wants to take us on in his purposes. So we're we're going to have to counteract the things that in the natural are not like Jesus. Is that right? And just to remind ourselves, wait a minute, Jesus is not like that, so I don't need to be like that. Mm -hmm. A few days ago, God spoke to me about vanity. Vanity. We don't often hear any uh, talk about vanity around here. What he was saying is that in Jesus there was no vanity. Now, what is vanity? Vanity is being concerned how you appear to others. It's concern about yourself and your image. Hello? Yes. Jesus wasn't vain. I mean, if, if Jesus was in his humanity today, he wouldn't have spent a fortune on clothes or cosmetics or anything like that. I'm sure he always appeared clean, neat, tidy. But vanity is wanting to impress others 
with myself because I have such a high opinion of myself. And all this came out of a scripture where, where God was accusing his people of, uh, of being vain and how they needed to repent and turn away from their vanity. I can't remember where it was now, but it's, it's around there somewhere in the word. <laughs> it says in the scriptures. <laughs> uh, so God does not want us to be a vain people. Because actually, vanity is emptiness. Mm -hmm. All all those things of vanity are empty. You know how so much of the the, sort of the fashion industry and all that business that that goes on, uh, there's a whole lot of emptiness about the whole thing. It's just a con on society. I can I can tell you that because. You know, my wife, when we were married, she was manageress of a, of a fashion store. And uh, she had a very good job for a young woman. Very responsible job. And so, of course, we used to get the trade magazines, the trade paper. There's a trade paper that comes out every week for the fashion industry. And this would be delivered to our home. I did not read it. <laughs> but... <laughs> Every now and again, I saw it lying around, and I'd pick it up and just glance at it. And I realized what a whole con the the fashion industry is, because they were deciding one year in advance what everybody would be wearing the following year, what colors they would be wearing, or this, or that, or the other. It was all a done deal. (laughs) I thought, goodness me. And, and sort of everybody falls for it, even more so then than now. I mean, now you just look around you and everybody wears what they want to wear. But it was... Well, except you do want to keep up with the fashions, you young people, don't you? Because, you know, I mean, 30 years ago when we had students, most of them would not have dressed in the crazy way that some of you dress. <laughs> so <laughs> to them it would have been crazy. You know, to wear a skirt and trousers would have been just ridiculous. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas now, if you've got your trousers without your skirt, everybody says, where's your skirt? If you've got the skirt without the trousers, what's happened to your trousers? I mean, it's... <laughs> Let's get back to being like Jesus, shall we? <laughs> so I don't dig a deeper hole from myself <laughs> But you see, fashions change, but the word of God doesn't. And Jesus doesn't. I mean, all these things are just peripheral, aren't they? They're just surface issues, really. And when when we focus on the surface issues instead of the heart issues, that's when we begin to go wrong. We think these superficial things are so important, and actually Jesus said, no, 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 no. What's important is your heart. Is your heart like mine? You know, Are you doing what what I would do? Are you saying what I would say? Uh, Are you actually walking as Jesus did? And the answer is no, but I'm walking more like him now than I did this time last year. And by next November, I will be much more like Jesus than I am now. Because I will be more transformed into his likeness. There will be more of the glory of Jesus shining through my life. So, the question remains, is there anything I can do that will make me more like Jesus? Well, yeah, you can die and go to heaven. But, I mean, apart from that. (laughs) 
I mean, is there anything apart from that that's going to help this whole process? I mean, is it possible for me to hinder the process? Is it possible for me to help the process? Because I, I'm surely, I'm not just a blob where things are happening to me. I'm either encouraging the will of God in my life or I'm doing stuff that is going to discourage the will of God in my life. So what can, what can I do to speed up this whole process of becoming more and more like him? Well, ultimately, it has to be a matter of desire, doesn't it? That's right. You see, Jesus promises to answer the desires of our heart. And I think, stroke no, that when he sees the desire, he answers it. I always find this a very sort of simple thing, really. I mean, how, can, how can any believer say, Jesus, I don't want to be more like you? I mean, that just doesn't sound right, does it? When his whole purpose is to transform us <clears throat> into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. How, how can we turn around and say, well, I, I don't want to be more like you, Jesus. You're a bit too radical for me. A bit too extreme. Let's just sort of quieten things down a little bit, shall we? Jesus, will you come down to my level? And he says, well, I've already done that because I already live in you. But you see, the reason why I live in you is to lift you to my level. I, I haven't come to live at your level. I've come and, and met with you at your level, but in order to lift you to my level. Mm-hmm. You are to live the risen life, not the old life. Yes? So, perhaps God has to do something in our hearts to say, Lord, I want to be holy like you. Now, holy in that sentence is spelled W-H-O. Double L Y. I want to be wholly, completely like you. But of course, that means I want to be H O L Y like you. Yes. So, holy in the sense of being holy and holy like him. Yes. It's too deep. All right. <laughs> Never mind. Pray about it and you'll get the revelation. The more completely like him we are, the more holy we are. That's right. And what, what, what is holy? Holy isn't sort of swanning around with, you know, oh, sort of dreamlike quality. I'm ever so holy. I'm so spiritual. You know, like the super spits, living in total unreality. 
the super spiritual people, the super spirits. <sighs> Did you remember what um, the Spirit of God says in, in Revelation 3 about the lukewarm? You know, you are neither hot nor cold. Therefore, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Ooh! That's what he thinks of compromise, lukewarmness, half-heartedness. So I want to spit you out my mouth. Now, the interesting thing is that we must be in his mouth if he wants to spit us out of his mouth, if we... But you see, we're in his mouth in the sense that he is constantly speaking his word into our hearts, into our lives, his words of life, his words of victory, his words of power, his words of healing. But it's like him saying, I can't relate to lukewarmness. I can't relate to compromise. I can't relate to half-heartedness because I'm not like that. It's not like me. Huh? I mean, you, you students that have came, this is your first term, you probably realize by now there's more to this Christian business than you ever thought before you came here. <laughs> and on the one level, you might wish you'd never come, but on the, other, <laughs> on the other hand, you know this is where God wants you because he didn't want you to miss his best. And you can only live his best when you know his best. Hallelujah. So I think we've probably got the message by now, haven't we? That lukewarmness is out, compromise is out, half-heartedness is out. We're there, like Jesus, fully, wholeheartedly, 100%. On good days, 110%. Yes? Everything focused on him, on wanting to do his will. We're not here for ourselves, for our own vanity, our own wishes, our own desires, our own image. Huh? Hallelujah. I'll say it because nobody else did. Hallelujah. Now, just before we pray, because I think after this lot we need to do some praying. God in his infinite wisdom chose you the least likely candidate. And he chose me the even least likely candidate. He chose Saul of Tarsus, who would not be on anybody's list for sainthood. (laughs) And now everybody calls him Saint Paul. He specializes in the weak and foolish, which is why you're here. (laughs) Hallelujah. He, He has a hard time with the intellectuals and the clever people because they think they're too clever for God. So he says, okay, I'll I'll deal with the weak and the foolish. Those who recognize they need me. I'll do a number with them. And and I I will make them so wise that they will confound the wisdom of the people in the world. 
I'll make them so wise because they'll be like me and they will see the wisdom of being like me. Yes. And they'll see the foolishness of the world that is not like me. Yes. They'll understand the wisdom of cooperating with me and fulfilling my will and purpose in their life and they'll see the absolute foolishness of sin. Hallelujah. So are you in the right place? Right place, yes. Yes. You're not here by mistake. Hallelujah. You realize God God brought you here. You you th- you might have thought you made the decision. You might have come kicking and screaming. But God actually put you here. And God put you here at this time because of what he's going to do at this time. Because we are about to see an eruption of Jesus, of Christ. You see, the thing is this. That if our focus is on revealing Christ in us, something dynamic happens with Christ among us. What happens in us personally becomes something dynamic corporately. Now, just before we pray, You know yourself pretty well, but you don't know yourself as well as Jesus does. He knows you even better than you know yourself. And and the good thing about Jesus is when he looks upon you, he not only sees you as you are now, but he sees you as you are going to become. You see? When, 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 when all the Christians that were being persecuted by Saul of Tarsus, when they looked at Saul of Tarsus, they could just see their enemy. But when God looked at Saul of Tarsus, before he called him, he could see the apostle to the Gentiles. Huh? He, he could see that. And so when he called him, he told him what he must do so that his voice would be heard. And, and how dynamic and effective his ministry was going to be. Because God could see it all before it happened. Other people couldn't see it. All they could see was Saul of Tarsus, the arch persecutor of the church. So God sees you as you are now. But he also sees what you're going to become. He sees how he's going to use you. He sees what your future ministry is going to be. And he sees that what he works in you now is taking you further, step by step, towards the fulfillment of what he can already see. So, what does the scripture say? Set your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Ah, so often, we, we, even, even when we look at our own lives and what's going on in our lives, we tend to look at what we see. But the scripture says, no, 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 no. Don't look at what you see. Look at what is unseen. Listen to what I say. Listen to my prophetic word. Listen to the promises I've given you. Listen to the vision that I'm giving you for your life. Understand what I'm going to make you into. And understand that what I'm doing now in making you more and more like me is going to enable that which I can already see. That which you're going to become. That which you're going to do. You know, I got filled with the Spirit a few months before I was ordained. 
And that all came about, I mean, at that time, nobody was talking about baptism of the Spirit. There wasn't a charismatic movement. There wasn't anything happening in the churches of any note. And <clears throat> I was afraid because I was a very fearful person. And the thing that I always was fearful of more than anything was making relationships with people because I was utterly convinced that people wouldn't want to know me, that they would want to reject me. And I thought, goodness me, to be a, a, a pastor, you've got to make relationships and know people all the time. And still I have to overcome that natural inclination. So I thought, God, this can't be right. You've, you know, how, how can you call me? I'm totally the wrong kind of person to be ordained. I mean, I genuinely believe that. So I shut myself away with the Lord and he literally physically breathed his spirit into me. I found myself speaking this strange language. Didn't have a clue what was happening. Even though in my finals at university I studied 1 Corinthians in Greek and knew about speaking in tongues, never met anybody who'd ever done it. Didn't really know what it was like and still couldn't understand the reason for it. But something happened that was enough to give me the courage to go forward with the ordination. And you know you, we wear those long black robes you know, called cassock. And just here there's a, there's a pen pocket under the, under the flap uh, of, of the gown. And, and I, I wrote the scripture... You know, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And I had that in my yeah. pen pocket on, on the day that, that I was uh, ordained. Because I was having to overcome all this sense of fear, totally unwor total unworthiness to ever serve the Lord like this. But God, you see, could see. I had no idea what God was going to do with my life. I just had to take that step at that time in faith. But what God did, you see, was a work of the Spirit that enabled that next step. And I'm only telling you this because, you see, that kind of principle gets repeated again and again in our lives. Where God brings you to a point where you don't know that you can take the next step. It may be fear, it may be a sense of inadequacy, it may be all kinds of things rises up within you. But God knows you will take that step. Amen. That's the thing. He knows you may hesitate. He knows you might have to go through some stuff. But he knows you will take that step. Because he knows that you will come to the fulfillment of what he has planned for you. So whenever we come to that point where we think, I can't, his answer is always, yes, you can, and you will. Amen. I know you will. What we learn with experience is not to hinder the process with a whole lot of prevaricating, you know, with a whole lot of delaying, making decisions that have to be made and taking steps of faith that need to be taken. 
That what you learn with experience is you don't hold back. You trust God. You take that step. He enables you. He equips you. You find yourself doing what you thought you could never do. And you've come through that barrier. And then then he takes you on. And and yes, there'll be another one. There'll There'll be another one of those moments where... Where, where you come, it seems you come to the end of yourself. I don't know that I can go on. I don't know that I can go any further. I don't know that I can be any more like Jesus. And he says, yes, you can. Yes. Come on. Because that's what I've called you to. That's why I'm living in you. That's my plan and purpose for you. And I am going to ensure that I will carry it out in you. Amen. You see, you don't look at God's call upon your life and you wonder, can I do it? No, of course you can't. But he can do it in you. And he will do it in you. And he will bring you through to what he wants you to do. So, you know, it may, come, may, may be that your point now is the miracle. The first miracle. The first genuine, real miracle. Wanted, God wants to do through you. Say, God can do a miracle. Yes, He can. I planned it. Come on. Yes. Come on. I've purposed it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's time to move out of the known into the unknown, out of the natural into the supernatural, yes. out, of, out of what you're used to into the miraculous. Yes. Isn't this what God has been speaking to us about yes. these last weeks? He's saying it's time. Don't hold back for fear. You have the anointing. So you are enough like Jesus to be able to do what he would do. And greater things still. Because that is just for believers. And you're already a believer. So you're already at that point. Hallelujah. Is this good or is this good? So let's all stand. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Come on, just just give him a shout of praise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so now, thank the Lord for what you're going to become. That he sees already what you will become. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, thank him for what he sees in you now. He sees Christ in you now. Hallelujah. Now thank thank him that he's your good shepherd. You know his voice and you're following him. You see, he's not pushing you into what you're going to become. He's leading you into what you're going to become. All you've got to do is follow him step by step and he leads you into what you're going to become. Thank you, Jesus. 
So thank him that you're here now. He has brought you to this place at this time. And while you're here, he's going to be leading you further into what you are going to become. And thank him that that means as you become what he sees you're going to become, that you are going to bear much fruit for his glory. You're going to have impact upon many other people's lives in the year ahead, in the years ahead. Come on, thank him for that. That he's called you to be like Jesus who did not live for himself. Hallelujah. So thank him that he has opened your eyes to the truth. Thank him that you are not living for yourself. Hallelujah. But you're living to fulfill the will and the destiny that God has for you. Now, the important thing is to surrender yourself to him for that destiny, even if you don't know what it is. Right? You may not know what it is. You probably won't know what it is. He's not likely to tell you now what that is. But just surrender yourself to him. Lord, I yield myself to you for the fulfillment of of that which you have destined for me, that which you have called me to, that which you already see shall be. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I think you can thank him a bit better than that, can't you? I mean, really. Lord, this is so wonderful. Thank him that he is the Lord and he is in charge. Now, your destiny may be something totally different from anything that you've ever conceived. Anything that you've ever thought may be totally different from what you thought when you came here. But that's all right. If you're surrendered to him, he will open up the way. He will begin to give you revelation. He will show you the way in which he wants you to go. So just thank him for that personal love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this is where we need to pray those scriptures that we began with. Jesus says, come to me. You don't only come to him at the beginning of your Christian walk. You come to him all the time, throughout. Your whole life is a coming to him. Now, thank him that you are in his heart. I mean, if you are, if you are in him, you are in his heart. And that's a humble, gentle heart. So thank him right now. That he has been dealing with you so gently, so tenderly, with so much love, so much compassion. And even though when you came here, some of you may have been like those bruised reeds or smoldering wicks, he has dealt with you so lovingly that You know, you haven't been crushed. You haven't been bruised. You've been liberated. (laughs) 
This is the love of God. This is the tenderness of Jesus. Thank Him that from His fullness He has given you grace upon grace. Already this term, He's poured out so much grace upon your life. Just thank Him now for all that you have received from Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just understand that Every time you receive from the Lord, you become just a little bit more like Him. He knows that the way you're going to be transformed is not by reforming your character, but by receiving from Him again and again and again. Grace upon grace upon grace. Amen. Hallelujah. He he wants to show you so much of his love that you won't want to live for yourself. So much of his love that you will want to live for him. So much. He wants to pour so much grace into your life that all you want to do is share Jesus with others and make him known to others. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, stand against fear, right? Fear has no place. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So, there's no need to fear the future. Come on, just, just thank the Lord. My trust is in you, Lord. I do not need to fear the future. I do not need to fear what the future holds. Hallelujah. I'm a person of faith, not a person of fear. And thank you that you will enable me to overcome all my natural fears. Hallelujah. Now, thank the Lord that when you have to take bold steps of faith, He's going to enable you. You're not going to be paralyzed by fear. You're not going to stop. You're not going to give up. You're not going to turn back. Right? You're following Jesus and there's no turning back. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, you say no to fear, but say no to vanity. Lord, I'm not interested in just putting on a good appearance for other people. I'm not going to spend my life worrying about how others see me. Hallelujah. All that matters is how you see me. Hallelujah. All that matters, Lord, is that I fulfill your destiny, your purpose. Praise you, Jesus. I'm not going to live in the emptiness of vanity. I'm going to live in the fullness of your spirit. Praise your holy name. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, you've made me. Thank you that you've called me. Thank you that you're going to use me. Thank you. You don't wish I was someone else. So, Lord, I'm not going to wish that I was someone else. I thank you that you've made me, me. Thank you that your call is upon my life. Your call isn't upon me being like someone else. Your call is upon my life, and you're making me like Jesus so that 
your call on my life will be fulfilled. Praise your holy name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, can you say to the Lord now, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. Thank him that every day, you know, what you receive in the lectures, revelation, testimony, what happens, all that is just a part of this whole unfolding process in your life. It's not just another lecture or just another day of lectures or just another day at Rafi or just another keynote or just another eight o'clock. It's all part of that purpose of him making you into what he sees you're going to become. Not one day is wasted in the Lord's purposes. So thank him that you're going to receive from him today. You're already receiving from him today. But you're going to go on receiving from him today. And he's going to further this purpose in you today. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Now, just, just finally, can you say to the Lord this morning, I'm ready to do whatever you ask of me. Do you remember what David prayed? Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Have you got a willing spirit? See, a willing spirit is an attitude, isn't it? That even before he asks you, you are willing so he knows he can ask you. Because you will do what he asks you to do. Sometimes he doesn't ask people to do things because he knows they're not willing. So he doesn't waste his time asking you to do things you're not willing to do. But pray that over your life now. Grant me a willing spirit, Lord, to sustain me in your purposes. That I won't back off, I won't back away, I won't say I can't, but I'll take the step of faith forward. I'll move forward with you, Lord, through the faith barrier, through the fear barrier, through whatever barrier stands in the way. Hallelujah. 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 Now, the Scripture says, Move the obstacles out of the way of my people. Amen. God does not want any obstacles standing in the way of his purpose. We just speak to all those obstacles now in the name of Jesus. And we just command them to go, to leave. There's nothing is going to hold on to our lives. Nothing is going to to be present in our lives that is going to hinder the purposes of God. We say no to all those obstacles in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The enemy cannot prevent that which you have purposed. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands and just praise the Lord.
Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. We glorify you. We magnify you. Yes, 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 yes. Purala bazata bari aleto bakalazita ba. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, just as we finish, listen to these two scriptures. These are two of my favorite scriptures from Isaiah. I say, the Lord says, I say, my purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Now, I love to personalize scriptures so they become more real for me personally. I'm going to read those again in a personalized way. The Lord says, my purpose for you will stand. And I will do in you all that I please. What I have said to you, that will I bring about in you. What I have planned for you, that will I do through you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. you find those scriptures in Isaiah 46, verses 10 and 11. Praise God. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.